So um, maybe uh, as a 34-year uh, veteran of General Mills and obviously more recently very involved with, uh, with the space, John, could you give a sense for those that were asleep or didn't listen to everything that was said this afternoon, what should our take-home messages be? What are the what top of mind the first messages that come to mind? Well, I was, uh, I was struck by this need for collaboration, that none of us are gonna solve these problems individually, that uh, we, we talked about ecosystems. We talked yesterday about the fact that innovation is going to come from uh, the small players, from, from innovators that are going to sort of break through and, and disrupt, uh, which is great unless you're sort of looking for a tried and true answer before you decide to invest. And so having the stakeholders in the room, having the right people in your camp, um, I think that's cool. Uh, the, having the, uh, the right folks in, the, in your camp to help advise you and, you know, to figure out what does the value chain look like because the, the, the risk, the responsibility, and the margin is not equally distributed, and yet we got to create that so that uh, we're able to find solutions together. Uh, I liked the idea of uh, ESG and, and sustainability agendas driving change, and I think that's true. But I think the reality is we don't know when that's going to hit. It's, it, you know, it's someday that will be the tipping point. But there's lots of good reasons to digitize and to automate and to invest in technology before that, right? And, and, and it has to do with it saves you money, it saves you labor, it, makes, it gets your employees more engaged. And, oh, by the way, you can get sustainability. But is there not a, not a fear that some people describe ESG as being like Euro Disney? The never, never profit land. Yeah. yeah. And, and so are we, are we in right danger of uh, pursuing uh, something that we're not entirely sure how we're going to make business sense of it? I, 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 think, I think that that holds a lot of people back. I, I think that everybody wants to do the right thing, but most of us want to read the last chapter of the book to figure out if we want to, if we want to buy it and then start reading. And the reality is this book isn't done yet. We haven't figured out the answer. Technology is going to continue to evolve and the needs of our stakeholders, our consumers, and what they expect of us will continue to change. And so my urging is you just got to get started, right? Let's, let's solve problems we got today that have the return on investment. We heard the BCG guys talk about, you know, there's lots of reasons to do this. We had a whole tech, we had a whole group this morning talk about, I can get return on investment for these things. That ought to tell us what to do. And our plan, we don't know what the end state looks like exactly. I think anyone who tells you that is lying to you. But si since you mentioned the book, I should take this moment to shamelessly plug <laughs> my book. Uh, it's available free online, uh, 160 pages on the future of ag tech. And uh, it's on, actually, it is on the Agri Tech Capital website. Or will be next week on Amazon, but that's a different story. So the good news is Aiden knows exactly where this is going. But the I rest know of it, us, I well, think... It is an e-book, so as the book changes, yeah, I can, I can he, continue he, to edit it. But it's a free of charge download. It's the benefit of authorship. Yeah, exactly. Um, ecosystems. Yep. Feels like a lot of people in the sandbox. Uh, what I like, obviously, about whatever Ag is doing is they feel like they're putting a lot of these ideas and technologies mm -hmm. and having them speak together. But isn't that a massive issue for us as customers? We, I mean, how many apps can you have in your telephone? I, I've, I've been on dairy farms where they literally have 16 different sources of information, for sure. none of which talk to each other. No, for sure. And, and I think that we talked a lot about um, this idea of you have to have a strategy. Boy, you need to know what the business plan is. Uh, the, both sets of consultants really said, where's your business problem you're trying to solve? I think that can also paralyze people. Uh, and so for me, I think the envision out there, we're gonna wanna know everything there is to know about the cow, what she ate, how much milk she gave, where that stuff has come from, what were the inputs used to do it, and how is that transformed into the product I'm, I'm getting. We're, we're gonna wanna know everything there is but I don't know when that's gonna be important to invest in. And so the key becomes, can we, if that's the plan, then the tactics are, what do I need, what can I do today that's gonna save me money? And does that further the plan some way? We will eventually get to the point where we've done A, B, C, D, M, and O, P, and then we'll decide if we want to fill in the gaps, if it makes the, 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 the stakeholders force us to sort of get that connectivity. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't do 
technology innovation today. Doesn't mean we shouldn't get on board today. We're in this rail station and uh, that train is leaving the proverbial station. Uh, it probably left 100 years it, ago. It, it but, uh, it, <laughs> yeah, this one. In this particular station. But isn't it also true that it feels like consumers are bringing us a conveyor belt of new demands? For sure. I mean, you've mentioned all these things, but you still haven't talked about carbon footprint. Mm -hmm. We haven't talked about animal welfare. We haven't talked, I mean, all of these other pieces that seem like on a daily basis we're being asked to also answer. And, and, and consumers are um, sometimes right, but never in doubt about what they want to know. <laughs> and, um, and, and as someone who spent 33 years trying to serve those consumers, you know, oftentimes in this kind of a conference, we were, the, the CPGs were portrayed as the, you know, we were the evil empire, trying to jack you guys around and tell you what you should do. And um, the reality is we're simply the mouthpiece for the people that end up voting. All the value in the system comes from the consumer, and then it's about how it gets passed down. Um, I, I do think that um, we have got to create a system where we do this together, um, and I do believe that over time um, we'll we'll have to evolve. I was asked one time. I was asked one time. You know, as these consumers who are changing their mind all the time, you know, your General Mills, you're talking about the changing model of the consumer and their values. And, you know, now we're all connected with our iPhone. And what are the things that the millennials are driving that actually is going to make you better? And then what's the thing they've got wrong? And, and for me, the answer was that it was a opposite sides of the same coin. A consumer wants to know absolutely everything about what they want to know. If they can't find it on Google, if it's not, if they can't, if Google doesn't come up with the answer, then all of us are just lying to them. It's a conspiracy. Their food wasn't made by a cow. Their food didn't come from a farm. It was made in a lab because they can't find it on Google. Now the truth is, someone knows the answer to this, but we collectively don't know the answer to these questions. And, the, and, and so, What's wrong is their assumption is if they can't find it out, then somehow they're being screwed. I think reality, and, and, and I saw this in my own company, our initial reaction to that was we were offended. Like, how could you think we would do that to you? We showed up honorably and we're taking care of you. How, and, but what made us better was if someone's gonna ingest our product, don't they have the right to learn everything they want to know about it? I mean, they have a, we have a pretty intimate relationship with our consumers. They are ingesting stuff that goes through our systems. We probably shouldn't begrudge them the opportunity to learn anything they wanna learn about that. Um, and that will make us better. The problem is, in general, we're taking care of them, we're doing the right things. You've heard the stories about how the dairy industry has evolved over time. That's a great story. They assume that because it's not easily understood and because we haven't packaged it right, that somehow it's a conspiracy against them and we'll have to work on that part over time, I think, Aiden. So, so you've obviously described yourself as having been part of the evil empire, mm -hmm. but you still got invited to the conference. I did, it's, a, it's ironic. Um, what about uh, cybersecurity? Do you, do you buy into the idea of Russian hackers, Chinese are breaking into our systems or are you skeptical or how? How, should, yeah. how, should, how seriously do we need to take this? Uh, you know, I think cybersecurity we need to take seriously. I, I think, but, but I think that, to be honest, um, we need to be really thoughtful about what are, the, what are the things we have to protect. I mean, it's not like the composition of milk and what our lab, what our lab results were are of mystery. It's in a pretty damn narrow range, right? Um, the, uh, it, it's not like the profitability of any of our enterprises are really that much, that magnificent. The, the part that we gotta protect is our ability to operate safely. And I think our biggest risk is indeed ransomware, someone deciding to shut us down. But to be honest, there's a lot sexier places to shut down than any of our businesses. Um, the, then it becomes, and we talked about it a little bit in the cybersecurity discussion today, um, it becomes the employee who's ticked off and they decide to be a bad actor. That's a much bigger risk. Someone deciding to, to you know, decide to take you hostage and they know how is a much, much bigger risk to our operations and our enterprise than some nation state deciding to go after the milk supply. I mean, the reality is we don't allow milk to cross very many borders anyway by regulation. So the truth is that it's not around economic gain. And I think that what we have to worry about is, 
our right to continue to operate, our ability to do that in a way that, because as we stated a lot in the last meet and the last uh, panel, the milk keeps coming. So we better be able to do something with it. Um, I get the impression so far we've had a very thoughtful conversation, so let me bring the level down. Okay. Um, maybe I could just do a hot knot with you. Okay. Uh, I'm not looking for thoughtfulness, I'm just looking for your top of mind reaction. So in the food business, chat GPT, will it be hot or not? Not. Not, okay. Autonomous vehicles. Warm. There's no warm, it's hot or not. I mean, did, we uh, not, did we'll, I not explain we'll, the rules we'll, of this game? We'll, uh, we'll, get, we'll get hotter, we'll, we'll get hot. I still think it's, not. okay. And on the farm, autonomous vehicles. Autonomous tractors, harvesters. Hot. Hot, okay. Food waste. Hot. Uh, that sounded like a very emphatic. Insect meal. Not. Cellular meats. Not yet. Fermented milk proteins. Not yet. Not yet, okay. Sensors. Hot. Virtual reality. Not yet. The metaverse. Not yet. Man. 3D printing. In, in the context is our space? Yeah. Not yet. Robotics. Hot. Hot. What else have I not, what else have I missed? It should be a hot or not. Um, visibility, transparency, this, this idea of people being able to look and see our stuff and, and, and sort of proving to themselves. So you mean, you mean blockchain? No, I sure don't, which I, that would be a not for me, but, uh, <laughs> but I do mean, and, and, and actually, that's a, that's a potential, but I think, you know, we, everyone wants to sell me blockchain, and I think... You've got that's, Bitcoin as well. I, I, yeah, that, that would have been a better investment for a period of time. Um, I, I think blockchain requires way too much consistency and clarity and brings a howitzer to a knife fight. Um, and, uh, you know, this, our consumers aren't that complex yet. Hopefully they will, you know, hopefully we'll have the technology available when they get there. But I think coming with that solution right now is overkill and we've got enough other problems. And obviously dairy farmers, uh, when they move in, they walk into Starbucks or whatever and they see 16 forms of milk, only one that comes from a cow. Yep. Um, what's your sense of that uh, space of plant proteins, particularly plant so-called milks? You know, I think it's really scary. Uh, and I think for this industry, it becomes, it's incumbent upon us to tell our story better uh, and to connect the dots better because I, I think our story is a good one. Uh, but at the same time, other upstart disruptor industries are coming in and they're telling stories that aren't necessarily verified but are, again, back to the consumer, they are sometimes right but never in doubt. And uh, as such, if I'm in New York, if I'm in uh, Times Square, apparently Oatly is the best solution for the environment in the whole world because they bought a corner at Times Square and told me that here's, our, here's ours and look at the blank page of us. Um, I, think that's, I, I think that's a scary dynamic that we have to react to. You know that you can ask questions through the app. As somebody who obviously decide they want to become nameless, they're calling themselves Dairy, McDa Dairy Face. <laughs> anyway, I'll read the question. What aspects of the dairy industry appear to be lagging most in digital transformation? Uh, I think it's the on-farm portion of this. I think we, you know, we've, we, we have, we're getting relative sophistication on the manufacturing processing side and those kinds of things. A lot of it driven by regulation. I think where our opportunity is to connect to the production side and, and further than just on the, uh, on the dairy farm, but to the row crops that feed that, that process. Um, I think we're gonna wanna understand that and, I, and we have been slow to make those connections. And, and yet I think that there are opportunities out there and, and the pressure gets higher and higher and higher. That's a place where we've got to, we, we have to do better. And, and, and we have to create an environment where we reduce the risk, we're more clear on what the ecosystem needs and we, don't, we can't put that burden on the producers. This can, the, the, the solution to these problems can't come on the back of the farmers. The farmers don't have the money to pay for this. Um, that, that isn't it. We, we have to find, the, we, the ecosystem has to enable that success. 
So, so, so just drill into that for me. Who yep. is we? Because you were on, in my perspective, the part of the business that made the most money. For sure. Um, not just General Mills companies mm, like that. No, but see, yep, have see, the, highest the branded companies within make the, the most the chain and Absolutely. So why don't you guys pay for it? Well, I think that what we'll find is um, we do. But, but here's what I'd tell you. Um, when you're coming to me and asking me to pay for your problems, my first question is, well, what are you doing to solve your problems? Uh, you know, when I think about sustainability or I think about value add, you know, the, 100% of the value is added at the cow, and then all the rest of us do is screw that up in some way or figure out. And so the question is, how do we build an ecosystem to capture as much value as possible as that cow did? You know, we've done great things there. And uh, I, I think uh, Steve mentioned today, uh, earlier on, this idea of we've got 70% more milk with 38% of the cows or something like that. If I got that, if they get that right? Um, so that's pretty damned impressive. Yet we still throw away a lot of out-of-code dairy. Um, we still don't talk to one another and we, we, don't, we can't deal with the milk flush sometimes. We, we, we have issues in that, in that sense. I remember when uh, we had to move quickly between we, put, we had all this dairy ready for food service and then suddenly no one went out anymore and we were throwing away milk all the time because we did, couldn't get into a consumer-friendly eat-at-home retail package during COVID. We've got our own issues here. So the first thing we ought to do is stop doing stupid stuff. Um, we, ought to, we, we ought to get the most out of what we got. We ought to create the connectivity so we can get some insights and then innovation can happen. The job of a, of a CPG is to create that innovation. It is, it, 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 is to, it is to foster the innovation. So I'll tell you one approach we used. Um, the move to regenerative agriculture, we believe, was the only way for us to get to carbon neutral at General Mills. Uh, you heard a person, uh, Beth, over here today. Um, she was actually the one that sold me on that idea. Uh, and, and as we approached it, we said, look it, I'm not going to pay people more. Matter of fact, I can't even guarantee that the stuff that's grown on this farm is the stuff that got into Cheerios in the first place. Because the beauty of the U.S. agriculture system is that we're able to capitalize on scale and, and regulation and, and uh, the, that commoditized, high-quality supply chain allows us to be super competitive. But what I can do is create an environment where I enable the success, I reduce the burden. If, 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 if I believe that regenerative agriculture and, and our experience would be when someone moves to regenerative, they're able to get their bait back in a year and a half, two years, because they're not, they're not measuring their manhood or womanhood as a, as a farmer by yield, but instead dollars per acre, dollars per bushel, because they're, mad, they're, they're managing both the cost of the inputs and the farm with the profitability they're able to get. Uh, but if I tell you that, and you've had in your granddaddy's granddaddy's granddaddy taught you how to farm, that doesn't necessarily, it's not an easy switch. And so what General Mills decided to do is, you know, we'll give you the consulting help. We will ensure your farm's profitability for the year and a half or two years of transition, in which case this thing ought to take care of its own. I'm more than happy to enable the success I think sometimes there's a, well, if you just pay for it, it's fine. And I think in, in that becomes this implied, I'm going to pay for the stuff that isn't being done well, and I don't, I'm, I don't want to sign up for that right now. Like, that's a tough bargain. For, I can't go sell that to my board. I can't, and I, I can't even get it past my sourcing buyer to me, much less me sell it to the board. When we're in a room uh, where we discuss digitization so much, um, what's the phrase they say that I'm up to... Uh, Man with a hammer, everything looks like okay. a nail. Yeah, right. Um, it seems like digital is going to solve everything. Mm -hmm. um, what's your, what are your drivers for digitization? What do you think are the key drivers for, you know, Connectera, yep. for the, yep. uh, for Everag, for Cantus, for all these technologies we see, particularly arriving on the farm, but also throughout the milk supply. Yep. Um, I think they are the same drivers that exist for all things. It, they just have to be applied in the right way. So. Um, all of us are facing labor challenges. Mm. Um, we are either worried that the 20 year employee who knows how to do everything and run that spray dryer we just talked about retires, and I don't know how to, do it. I don't know how to deal with that. Um, 
I'm going to hire somebody, but I, I, it, right now it takes them 20 years to get that level of capability as opposed to their speed to competency being enabled by digital. Um, I'm being asked to provide information that I don't track right now or I don't have the people for. Uh, I am, there, there was an interesting paradigm driven the, the yesterday, the Daryl, I think it was, um, from Zimpro said, all of this technology is really doing is taking big farms and making them small again. I mean, I think that's, the technology deal just is slowing down the state of play, right? I'm, I'm able because there's machines taking care of a lot of stuff to focus on the stuff that I can uniquely solve. And the rest is kind of, I, I don't have to focus on everything. Uh, the, the technology of, I know which cows in particular I need to spend my time on, rather than I gotta spend equal amounts with everything the likelihood that I will have a healthier herd, that I will have better outcomes when I'm focused on the exact right cows at the exact right time, I think that furthers our success. Um, so I think that labor, productivity, traceability, um, and the disruptions that we're all experiencing will all be enabled and helped by digital. What I don't believe is there's a magic digital solution. If you just bought it, it would solve all your problems. Because not everybody has the same problems. Uh, not, not everybody has the same needs and scale. And so finding your way into how can it help you in real time with this idea of end-to-end -end connected visibility, I think, is the, is, is the pill. I, I do believe that's the, that whatever is necessary with hammers and wrenches and impact drivers, et cetera, to get to that solution. I think that solution's real. I don't know when it's gonna become a big deal. So if I choose the right ones along the way, I have faith that we'll come up with a good answer at the end. But John, a lot of people have uh, the same on farm. They've got the same uh, information iPad you have here to your left, yep. a piece of paper, and I've asked them why they don't replace it with a screen. And they said, well, th this, one, this one here, I'll just use my book. This one doesn't break. Yep. The screen doesn't break. We have no issues with Russian hackers. For sure. Um, how, how do you change that mentality of paper has been good for me, my, my daddy, my granddaddy? How do you change that mentality? In, in my mind, it's finding the, the but, but there's, there's usually a pain point. If there's no pain point, they're going to be late adopters. Mm. I mean, we, I was at lunch today and someone said, you know, it's hard to get somebody, uh, hard, hard to get somebody excited about an online, uh, you know, manifest tool for milk when they're using a razor flip phone. Yes. I, I got that. I, I get that. Uh, and, you know, this works fine, but I re why would I replace it? And the answer is because the world's going to pass you by. Yeah. I mean, the, 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 the part we need to get better at in trusting each other is that when, and there was a uh, veiled reference by Paul today around a big company that sends out some surveys and forces you to comply and then takes credit for all of your stuff. Uh, we all knew who that was and um, uh, because they sell 29% of everything in the United States. But the... Uh, but the truth is, that is gonna become the price of admission at some point. So the question is, how are you gonna get on board? I, I think that you just can't be obsoleted. So yes, this, this might solve your problem today, but what happens when you retire? What ha who are you gonna hand this thing off to? Um, and, and, and what are the problems you can't solve today that you're, you got an itch you need to scratch, and can that be a building block to get you to the future? I think that's gotta be the question we ask. And, for, and, and so not everybody's gonna sign up right away, but I think over time, the pressure will become overwhelming. And, and you know, we've seen how this industry adapts. This industry has done remarkable things over time and changed itself and reinvented itself. Part of it's because the margins are such that you sure as hell better figure it out. Part of it's because every other industry has inventory as a ma major slop. You know, if, if, if you can't quite figure it out, you carry an extra 30 days of this or an extra, day, extra six months of that. You can't do that in our industry, right? You get, you know, the, once it's milked, the, the clock starts ticking and, uh, and then we throw it away. So I think it's forced us to be more rapid adopters of things and, and evolve. And I think that over time, we will move the industry. It will take some tip of the spear people to start moving it. And, and I think the job of uh, General Mills or of anybody else is to enable that kind of thing. But the reality is um, there's no one in this room who's participating that isn't smart. And they can, the, econ the, the economics are well understood and people will make the right decision. 
Okay, question from the audience, the happy cow. Mm -hmm. I'm, sure it's I'm in favor. Happy cow wants to put up their hand or not. Anyway, that's their, that's their, 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 uh, their name on screen. The dairy industry has been getting beat up by new ideas for food. How do you suggest the story might be crafted about the energy efficiency of dairy? Uh, so in other words, we, yep. we have a good story to tell. The presumpti I think the presumption is we have a good story to tell. We, I think there are some examples where we can tell that story. I think the problem is we aren't, we aren't wired and we haven't created that model to be able to prove it uniformly. Uh, and so the, the, I think the answer to the question, you know, maybe it's rhetorical, but, the, but the, the point is we have to come up with that story. We have to prove that story for it first. And it can't be the one example. Uh, there can't be the exception to the rule. It has to be the way we operate. Uh, I, I think that, um, and, and I'm a, you know, just a little bit of my background. My birth certificate, I was born in Framingham, Massachusetts. In Massachusetts, you have to declare your mother and your father's occupation on your birth certificate. Uh, mine says my dad was a pasteurizer for, a, for hood dairies. Um, so this has been in my blood a long time. Uh, and I'm a fan of the dairy industry. I think that we are the answer to a lot of questions. At the same time, I think it's important for us not to be defensive. We won't win that battle. People have a supposition that we, so you, we're getting beaten up. Being defensive is not the answer. It's we've got to be transparent and have the truth set us free. That is, I think, the answer to the, to the question. We can't, if, it's, if it feels like we're spin doctoring, then I think it will be accused of spin doctoring. If instead we're simply being transparent about the realities, then I think we have a very, very good story to tell. But you saw a new scientist came out yesterday saying that cellular meats produce 34,000 times more carbon dioxide than cows do um, at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, we've been outmaneuvered by, for argument's sake, the almond meat milk people who are growing almonds in areas, typically deserts, where you right, where Right, where they steal all the water and then create a problem, yes. So, so how are they winning? Uh, because they're talking. Because they're choosing to have a, they're choosing to have a thesis. We, it's, you know, ours, our, ours has been, um, we've been silent and I think worried. I hope this gets solved, I hope this goes away. I, I don't think that can be our. I don't think that can be our answer. And you know, our ecosystem is very, very complex. And, and because of that, it requires us all to be on the same page to solve the problem. Uh, it, there are lots of stakeholders. There are there's lots of information. None of us holds all of it. And so the ability to sort of create that story requires a level of understanding that, as an industry, I don't think we've we've scaled. We have it, we have it in, in Steve's farm. We have it, but we don't have it across our industry, and I think that's the part we have to unlock. Do you see regulations coming? This is another from the audience. Do you see regulations coming that will force a digital transformation? How do we prepare for that? Um, I don't know. I mean, there could, not, there, I think. Not I, usually the US way, is it? No, or? it's not. It's not. The, the comment was made not the North American way. It sure as heck isn't the US way. Might be the European way. It, it, for sure it's the European way. Matter of fact, I think we'll, we'll see that over time. But the US way, you know, we'll get a re enough regulation, and then we vote in a Republican, and then it all changes. So I'm not, I don't think that's the. I don't think that will force us. I agree with Michael's point of view yesterday when he kicked us off. It said, you know, what's gonna change us is the consumer. And I agree with that. I don't know when, and I don't know what the value equation will be, but I think it's an inexorable truth. So the question is, if we wait for regulation to give us clarity, I think that's unlikely. I think that we're gonna have to find things that are good for our producers in the ecosystem that meet the needs of the consumer. I think this will be a consumer-driven evolution over time. I don't think it'll be a revolution. It's not like people are gonna stop drinking milk because they, they're unsure about the greenhouse gas footprint or because they haven't been able to Google the solution. But over time, and, and by the way, I know that we're all concerned about coconut milk and oat milk and we see them as, you know, we're offended when they come at and we see the attack. The reality is the amount of the population that's partaking in that is pretty damn small. So let's not, let's not get too caught up in the interlopers and let's instead start playing our game. I think that's the message I would have. Moses wants to know, what do you recommend in terms of IT capacity building 
is about to outsource IT services from experienced professionals rather than trying to build your internal team? I think it depends on, well, I, I think that, um, good question, Moses. I think it depends on your scale. I think it depends on, um, Anytime you outsource something, I, I'm, I, I believe that if you can't build the scale, you can access the expertise. I'm all about buying it. I, I don't think you need to build it. That said, I think most people are naive buyers. And they don't really know what they bought and don't really know how to measure the success. And so I think the key is whether you built or you bought, do you know what you want? Do you know how to measure whether or not it's getting you what you want? And do you have a relationship where you can fix that over time? Um, I think that I, I'm, I'm a believer. I, I actually believe in the ecosystem. So to the extent I can buy from somebody who knows more about stuff than I do and will have the wherewithal to innovate faster than I would, and, and as they're making capital decisions, it'll be in the space so I can count on them to do it versus me doing it. I'm a, I'm a believer that that's the way we ought to operate. But caveat emptor, right? You gotta know what you're buying, you gotta know how you're, you know, what, what you need and, and hold your suppliers accountable. Otherwise, they have more control over you than you have over them. Uh, great question here from Matt. Everyone in the room has a different job. What is the one thing we could all do in our own way to make a positive difference for our dairy industry? So what could we all do collectively to make a positive difference for the dairy industry? That's a great question. I, you know, I, I've been, um, you're the man who knows the future of- I, I do know the future, so, you've got to read the book too. That, that, to, that, again, that's no, great, but I'll, I'll, I'll ask you to tap in. <laughs> I, I, what's your answer to that while I, uh, while I scramble uh, to create mine? Okay, well, I, I hadn't seen that coming. Um, <laughs> in, in general, when I've been on dairy farms, which I am a lot, looking at different technologies, I think there has been traditionally a fear of consumers and an unwillingness to discuss what goes on the farm. And I'd like to tell you I've never seen bad things happen on a farm, but I have. I've seen people who want to get their cows in for milking faster, so they take a little stick out and they hit the back of the backside of the cow, forgetting that if you stress the cow, you're going to give her mastitis and somatic cells, and Less it's not milk. good for the milk, and eventually it's not good for the cow. So they're dumbasses. Yep we don't call them out. And so if there's one thing I, I'd like to see collectively is to say a zero tolerance policy for, hmm. for, for, for people who do bad things in our business. That, that, I don't know, maybe that's a little top of my top of head. Uh, maybe I could think of something yeah. deeper. No, I, I but, think But that's... I would start with, certainly start with saying we have a massive uh, light now, spotlight on our business. We have to be transparent in a way we didn't have to worry about 30 years ago. Yeah, I, that's, a, that's a great answer. Um, I think that the art of, still, of telling the good story is the part that we all need to get better at. And, and whether that is as simple as, hang on a second, it, was it, you know, 1950 we had 25 million cows and today we have 9 million cows and we make 70% more milk. That sounds pretty sustainable. That sounds like a good continuous improvement story. Uh, and, by, and by the way, we took, you know, we all, and well, yeah, you did that with hormones. No, no, not anymore. Yep, yep, we, we've learned, we found our way through. I mean, there's, there's tell you, to fi figure out your good positive story to, to publicize our industry. Um, talk about the farm in Morris, Minnesota, where um, they understand where their row crops come from. They actually grow some, they actually grow both hay and, and corn on, in their fields. Um, and they collect the manure. They have a manure collection system. Uh, they, they collect and they collect the, um, the hay and the bedding. Um, they'll go sterilize that, grind it back up and, and turn it turn back that, in. Uh, river. And, and um, they will take and separate the solids from the liquids. They'll actually plumb the urea back into their field so it ends up being the nitrogen source for their crops that the cows are now eating. And they have a biodigester that's creating enough energy to both power their farm and sell back to the grid. Now, are they, are they carbon neutral? No, but that creates a lot of opportunity. This can be done. Um, the, the, the technologies exist and, and we will create the environment to make it exist. There are great stories out there. That, that being sure you have one in your pocket to be able to blunt the attack. Again, consumers are sometimes right, but never in doubt. You being able to create some doubt uh, is, is something that I think 
we could all do as a service to, to help this industry. Um, Seth Godin said that uh, artificial intelligence is neither. It's not intelligent and it's not artificial. artificial right. <laughs> so uh, what's your opinion on artificial intelligence? You know, I think um, it's, it's funny because I think we tend to blur, you know, machine learning and artificial. It sounds like really gee whiz stuff. And we get all like, oh my God, I'm not ready for that. And the answer is, well, hang on a second. You have a thermostat in your house, right? And it gets cold and then it turns on a furnace because you want to get warmer. I mean, that is essentially a, a monitor and a control. That's a, that's a decision being made by something that isn't you automatically. That's AI. Um, now, there's also chat GPT that'll write your kid's uh, essay. And I just had a kid graduate and he informed me of that, which <laughs> didn't make me super happy, but it is what it is. Um, but there's spectrums all in between, right? I, I mean, I, I think that um, we will, over time, why wouldn't we make automatic the things that we could make automatic that are safe and we can add value on so that we can focus on the things that we can uniquely do? I don't think we should ever be afraid of that. And I think particularly in this time of our lives where we've got challenges around labor and, and you know, immigration policies are unclear and those types of things, that the idea of automating what we can automate such that we can deal with the problems we've never solved before, I think we ought to find that empowering. Uh, and, 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 you know, it's interesting. I remember trying to sell new technology at General Mills to my CFO, and he said, well, what's the return? And the answer is, well, I'll be able to get, you know, this in the future. Now, the truth was, it's because if I didn't do it, I'd be down here, but I'm gonna get, we're gonna, we're gonna spend time leveraging technology because the world's getting harder and harder to operate. You know, we all long for the good old days. Those are gone, they're gone forever. So now the question is, how are we gonna get better or the same results with, with and, and the answer is we're gonna leverage, we're gonna get help. We're gonna have to get help. We're gonna have to get information and insights to get things to be different. I think that's the, we should not be afraid of that. Um, and to the extent we can safely outsource our decision making to something that's reliable and predictable, I'm all in favor of it. Yeah, remove that. I mean, one man's opinion, but one sorry, one man's opinion, but that's yes, that. yeah. Well, that's that's what you're allowed when you're apparently when you're, yeah. when, when you're concluding a conference like this. Um, you know, I, I think so far. Uh, please help me out with more questions if you have more. Um, easy question, I guess, would be uh, where do you see the dairy industry 40 years from now? Um, well, I know your answer to this question. No, you don't know my answer. I, I, uh, I, I, so I wouldn't answer this question. Exactly, because you know, <laughs> the smart person doesn't. You know, I, I didn't assume I'm 57. At 17, I didn't assume I'd be walking around with a computer that had video, with a TV and a computer and a music player and a, in my pocket and, and, the, and the world's knowledge at my fingertips. And a GPS. I didn't assume that to be the case. Uh -huh. um, and as such, I don't know. Uh, but the, what do I think will be more of? Um, I think we will have much more closed loop systems. I think we will have figured out how to have different players in the value chain share knowledge be bonded together and share value, uh, both monetary and non, and whether that's in a, is that gonna look like uh, we understand the price of carbon and that's, I, I don't know. Um, but I do know that, I, I believe that if we don't solve the ESG challenges, that'll be problematic for this industry. So I think we will have leveraged technology to do that. I think that it takes a village of stakeholders that are all committed to that and we need a, a way to solve those problems. And I think they will be unique. I, I, I mean, I, I mentioned regenerative agriculture. Well, um, most farmers buy crop insurance in order to protect themselves. Well, if you follow regenerative practices, statistically you can show that you're less vulnerable, you have more resilience, you're, you're less likely to have a disruption. Why shouldn't insurance for that kind of a farmer be cheaper? And it should. Um, you know, why if we're taking economic risk, if we know the practices, why, why shouldn't that lead to different risk decisions? I think that we will understand and see more and that'll help us create better decisions and better ecosystems. But 
Is that 10 years from now or 40 years from now? I don't know. It, we will not, it, there will probably be, you know, we'll be making, you know, milk in Petri dishes. Um, there will probably be things like that. But most of our milk's gonna come from cows. Well, but, and we'll, we'll see how, the, how it evolves over time. But, but I would have thought, I was just kind of expecting that from a general mills or not so much, but from a food perspective, yep. we would see more prescriptive um, precision nutrition, maybe even taking the decision out of the hands of us as consumers and being told this is the food you're going to eat. Yeah, I, you know, Soylent Green, that kind of, uh, that, that model, uh, if you've, seen, steroids, the, if you've yes. seen the movie. Um, steroids is the wrong phrase, but you know. Right. right. Um, no, I don't think that's going to be the case at all. I don't think we're going to get to the place where it's just, you know, you take... You don't the think your insurance company comes and says, sorry, John... That's Abs what absolutely, I, do. I think that could be the case. But that'll be an ecosystem decision of me saying, do I want cheaper rates or not because I'm following a prescribed deal from my insurance company? I think, that in, I think that what we'll find is we've got to create values for individual markets of one. And we will know a lot about each individual market because we understand their DNA, we understand what's going on, and that will create tons of market opportunities for people. Um, they will know that they need these things in particular and that will affect what they eat and how they act um, if they choose to have that be the case. But I can't see us getting to a place where the government issues, this is what your breakfast is. This is maybe in prisons, but not in... Uh, Back to Europe. But yeah. <laughs> another possibility, but, but not in the United States. Not in the United no, States. I don't okay. see that. Not under Republicans, Democrats. Same answer. Uh, yeah. Okay, let's go for uh, last questions then. Uh, there's an anonymous question here. We talked about startups on day one. I'd love to have your insights on how emerging brands can partner with CPG companies to scale and can there be a win-win? Uh, absolutely, there has to be a win-win. Uh, and, and I do have some experience in this, and I think that most progressive CPGs have got sort of venture capital arms or, or ways to sort of incubate. The truth, and you heard, you know, most of the innovation, whether it was uh, the woman from uh, Wayward Spirits, what I thought was fabulous and fascinating. Um, did you order her? Uh, damn straight, I did. I got, got, a, got it right away. I love the gift box delivered to my house in two days. Um, I, I think that, you know, here's the, here's the reality. It's hard to make money in this situation. And if you're a publicly traded company, I don't have a venture capital fund that's willing to lose money on my behalf in order to have something potentially big happen someday. Um, little guys do. And so the truth is the model in the capital markets have changed. What people buy a General Mills or a Unilever or a Procter & Gamble for is guaranteed results and returns over time, almost equity level returns with bond fund risk. That's why people buy big food company stocks. And that's what they get. So that is not a formula for, and by the way, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to throw 100 pieces of something against the wall and see what sticks which is the model for innovation and, and small startups. I need that stuff to get figured out by them. And then I find something that looks pretty good, but they have no idea how to manufacture at scale. They have no idea how to go call on Walmart. They have no idea what channels look like and how to navigate through that. That's where I think the bigger companies can, whether, whether you be a, a, um, a middle supplier or an end CPG, that's where I think the enablement comes. I think that now suddenly we'd give away the expertise. I, in, in a particular case of my former employer, um, we had a $20 million capital fund that we would decide how we distribute. Um, and if we saw something that was good, we'd buy in, but we'd end up buying it four, four or five times the equity stake we actually put in because we said, we're gonna give you supply chain expertise, quality expertise, we're gonna give you a laboratory space, and we're gonna give you a sale, we're gonna tell you how to sell that ought to be worth something in kind and as such, and, and sometimes that'll be a hit. It will give the big companies insight into things that they just couldn't afford to get after. It just, it's too small, but someday it'll be a big deal. You know, Greek yogurt wasn't a thing until it was what, you, now it's not Greek yogurt, it's just yogurt. There's, <laughs> it, it's, it happens to be what we used to call Greek yogurt, but it's yogurt if you wanna buy yogurt. Um, and, and now everything else is more niche. That transformation happened because someone decided to, decided to win and innovate in the marketplace. Okay, here we have our last one then. Is there a source for good news stories without the buzzword bingo terminology? Like 
a kind of dairy blog that can counter the narrative? I, I mean, I guess the answer has to be yes. But I think we got to be careful thinking that people will read our stuff. People don't want it. So I had to learn, and, and we had lots of great stories at General Mills, but no one believed me when I told them. <laughs> because, because, well, clearly, you're, you have a conflict of interest. I'm not going to believe anything you say. So the question is, got, we've got to have those stories that are remarkable and provable and people can see for themselves. That cre people blogging about us is way more powerful than us blogging. No one's going to, no one's going to buy our stuff. They think we're conflicted. And by the way, we are, even if we're trying to be honest about it. I mean, they're, they're, we are, by definition, if we're economically involved, our stories aren't necessarily palatable. I the, the, the answer is, so, I'm yeah, sorry, I, exactly, yeah. I, I think the magic is being transparent and having the story tell itself. Having, and, and you know, I, I, well, gosh, we don't know what they're going to find. And the answer is, yeah, but if we're trying to do the right things, we ought to wallow in our, we ought to wallow in our opportunities. And, and the more transparent we can be, the more we know about our own problems, the more the stories will be written on our behalf as opposed to us writing those stories. Um, I think that's the magic in this. There's lots of space for good stories, but we can't keep people out and expect that they're going to believe what we have to say about ourselves. I think that's super naive on our part. Yeah, and the, the best I've seen in social media the believability of farmers seems to be infinitely higher than companies. For sure. So anybody that's on, any farmers on Twitter, any farmers on Facebook, they're getting great numbers. Per and particularly if they're a woman, aren't. if they're a woman who's, you know, raising a family and is a dairy farmer and talks about, I mean, these people have huge followers and that's what America wants to know. They want to know that their food is made by real people that have names and, you know, have dirt on their jeans and all of that kind of stuff. Uh, that demystifies all the stuff that corporate America potentially could cloud the issue with. So I'd like you to join me in thanking John for his great insights. Thank he obviously you, paid attention all the way through the, uh, the day and a half. And uh, John, I hope you get the chance to read my book as well. As uh, me another. too. Thank yeah, you. There we go. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. John, very good. Very good.